be in the book of Ruth. So if you'll go ahead and grab your Bibles and join me in the book of Ruth. And we believe in equality and fairness here. And we preached about the guys. So young ladies, we're going to preach for you today. This lesson is for the ladies, young and old. And of course, the application is for the, the men as well. Uh, that, that way the men will be able to recognize a virtuous woman when they see one and they know how to support their ladies to continue being righteous. And so I hope this will be a blessing for you as we're going to talk about Ruth and Naomi this morning and that mentorship that they had. And there are several characteristics that were handed down from Naomi given to Ruth. If you're looking for the book of Ruth, it goes, Joshua judges Ruth. And for that reason, I told my daughter, Naomi Ruth, she can't marry a guy named Joshua because Joshua judges Ruth. <laughs> All right, that was my joke for today. That'll get us going. All right, let's open up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you so much and we love your word. And Lord, I do ask this morning that you would help all of us that have dedicated our time to come early for this spiritual leadership class. Lord, I ask that you would fill us with the Holy Spirit. I ask that you would draw out these concepts out of the scriptures. Lord, I ask that you would give me the mind of Christ this morning as I teach. I pray that these words would go into our heart. Help us to learn these concepts and these doctrines and give us a guide to live by. Lord, I love you so much and I ask that you would bless all of the events of our church today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ruth chapter 1, if you'll read verse number 1, it says, And now it came to pass in the days, I'm sorry, in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Now, I'm going to tell you that the husband made a bad decision here to leave the area that God had put them in, the area of their blessing. He had made a bad decision, and he did it for money. And he went to a wicked nation, but the wife submitted and obeyed. She obeyed God, and ultimately God blessed her in the end when judgment came. And so I want to remind you, first of all, the, you, don't, you should not leave the blessing of God just to go for a better job. I've heard it said, everybody has a price. And it's like, well, life is good. The family's spiritually healthy. We love our church. Oh, a million dollars? Well, for a million dollars, I mean, you know, I'll go live in Vegas or San Francisco. I'd say, no, you keep your dirty million. I'd rather be poor and be with my family and be with my church family growing spiritually. I do believe that they made a mistake here. The first thing that we see Naomi teaching is submission that's paired with service. Now, submission and service are contrasted against selfishness and sensuality. The world, they want to tell you, do what feels good for you. Be selfish. Live for yourself. Sensuality. Do what feels good. That's the devil's message, and he wants to sell it to your ladies. But listen, ladies, God's blessing are on those that uh, believe and teach and do submission paired with service. Those things are the opposite. Submission and service versus selfishness and sensuality. Continuing in verse number 2. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came unto the country of Moab and continued there. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years." So I want you to show, see here that for the next 10 years after this horrible incident, you move to a bad place. God's curse begin, comes on your family. The husband dies in whatever situation we're not told. But I want to, to notice here that Naomi now submitted to her adult son's leadership as the Bible teaches that women should be under authority of a man. This is God's method. This is not something that men should use for control or manipulation. But this is God's perfect plan. The man was created first. 
So Naomi stayed under her adult son's leadership. In 1 Corinthians 11 it tells us, but I, would not have, but I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. And God does have a pecking order, and He does want women to submit to the man. Mom should not be bossing around dad, period. That is not God's plan. Continuing in verse number 5, And Malon and Chilion died also, both of them. And the woman was left with her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. I do like here that she is taking the oversight now of the younger women. So she has no man as her head. She is the elder woman, and now she is teaching the younger women. So she takes the oversight of the younger women, and she taught them the fear of the Lord. She taught them about her God. In 1 Timothy 5, it says, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, and guide the house, Give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. The devil can reproach Christians and families and even bring an accusation to God when women do things out of order for a selfish or a sensual purpose, then everything is out of order. Here, Naomi, as she's leading by example, she takes these two young ladies, Orpah and Ruth, and she's teaching, hey, here's what we're going to do. Here's where we're going to go. She is taking the oversight of leadership here. Look at verse number 7. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. I find it interesting here that good leadership will often allow for the opportunity of self-choice, of self-determination. Good leadership allows others to become their own person in this process. Now look, I know that we need to lay down the law and we need to teach what the right way is. But if you're too oppressive or perhaps the leader is a narcissist only serving themselves and loving themselves, they never actually help the student become mentored into becoming their own good godly person. The goal is, is that our children, as they leave our house, that they would become their own Christian. They can only go to heaven by their own personal faith with God. It's not because mama was saved. It's not because daddy was saved. And the goal is that we're guiding them to become their own person and that they can serve God freely by their own will. We teach this by leading by example. We teach this by teaching God's uh, First, the law of the gospel. If you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will go to hell. That's the foundation. Then you build the house on that foundation and you teach, well, whatever you plant in your garden is going to grow. So what kind of a house do you want to grow? What kind of a life do you want to have? We teach God's laws and that when you keep them, there is a blessing. And so as we train up the next generation of leaders, we have to give them an opportunity to lead themselves. She says, go ahead and go back to your land and your gods. She gives them an opportunity as a test, as a trial, to see if they're going to choose to follow God. Look at verse number 9. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest. I love, I love, think about this word rest here, because right now you've got three single ladies fighting for themselves, scrapping to get every bit that they can. The women's lib movement, by the way, was a conspiracy against women. It was empowered by harlots. If you know the history of it, uh, Edward Bernays, the book Propaganda, where they wanted to get mama out of the house and into the factory and the children's minds and hearts in control of the government so they can train them up to be good government slaves and go off and die for a cause or under the banner of a flag. Instead of living for God, they wanted them to die for a country. That's the history of the women's lib movement. I want you to notice here, she says, grant you rest. Think about this word rest. She's saying rest from your labors. How does that work? Verse 9, look at it with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, 
each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. She's teaching them that true rest comes from serving your own husband by winning a husband, having a husband, and being under his protection and under his wings. That is when a lady has godly rest. Continue in verse number 10. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there any yet more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn again, you my daughters. Go your way. For I am too old to have an husband. If I should say, if I have hope, if I should have an husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whitherest thou goest, I will go. And whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. And thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest will I die, and, where, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death depart, part thee and me. It's interested here that we see that both parties are truly invested and willing. We see some, uh, some very determined ladies here. We see that Naomi's determination and her love for the Lord has poured over into Ruth. And she says, no, where you go, I'm going to go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Where you live, I'll live. Where you die, I'll die. Your God is my God. And I'm going to go with you and be with your people and with your God. She recognized the curse of the hand of the Lord against Moab, the wicked nation. She understood the culture she was raised in was against the law of the Lord. And she wanted to be with God's people. Naomi had invested in her over those 10 years, and now she was a saved saint, a sister. And so they were pairing together. And it's interesting, Naomi was not a goat chaser. <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't go always chasing goats, trying to get them to come to church. She was guiding the sheep gently. Orpah went her own way, which, by the way, that's where Oprah gets her name, but she changes it. I don't know if you guys knew that or not. That is where she gets her name, the one that rejected the God of the Bible. That's Oprah. Well, here we have Ruth, a young lady willing to give up everything to go to a strange land and serve her mother-in-law to be her servant in a foreign land because of the blessings that she's already received of salvation through the promise of God. What a neat thing here. She was a saved sister, a saint. Continuing, let's take a look at verse number 18. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. Again, very determined ladies. Mentorship is best when the followers, listen to me, have made up their mind that they're going to follow, where they are determined. She was steadfastly minded to go. They've decided, I'm going to become the best follower of God that I can, and I'm going to do the extra work. I'm going to show up early. I'll stay up late. I'll go where I need to go. I want God's blessing. And this young lady was steadfastly minded to go. She had already determined she wanted God's blessing on her life. And listen, you ought to reproduce yourself spiritually and become determined to go, to get the verses in your heart, to go with the Holy Spirit and preach these verses to others. Continuing, look at verse number 20. And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, this is when she comes home, call me Mara, which means bitterness. <laughs> For the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me. This is very interesting that Naomi was demonstrating public humility, and public humility is best shown 
That's how you teach somebody to be humble. You don't tell them to be humble. You show them how to be humble. She came in confessing that her family was destroyed. God's curse was on her life. She was admitting the wrong of her family. She didn't blame her husband. She took it upon herself and says, God is judging me. God has dealt bitterly with me. God's hand is against our family. She was teaching humility by her words, but also by her actions. And Ruth really picked up on that. As we get into the next chapter, so my first point was this in chapter 1. She taught submission and service instead of selfishness and sensuality. It wasn't just about what I want or making me feel good. No, no, no. It was about serving others and finding God's blessing in that. Submitting to others and watching God reward and protect you through that. Chapter 2, look at verse number 1. And Naomi had kinsmen of her husbands, a mighty man of wealth, the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. So she hears of this man. She hears uh, that, that there is family. There's near kin. And so she submits herself in this sense. And she wants to be associated with those that are of the household of grace. And this is important because, listen, singles, if you're single, I want to encourage you to stay separate from an ungodly crowd. We are called to separation. We are called to fellowship with God's people. So always remember that. Never put yourself in a situation with somebody that's not saved. And, and she was seeking to be under God's blessing. And that's what she was looking for. Uh, look at verse number 3. And she went and came and gleaned the field after the reapers. And her hap was to light on a field at the, at the field belonging unto Boaz, who was the kinsman of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee. I like this because he is an honorable, kind leader. Did you notice he cared about the people? He's blessing the people. He cares for others. He and they, they respond back, The Lord bless you. Wouldn't it be great if you had a boss that every time he, that you saw him, you really felt like he cared about you as if he had been praying for you and he publicly asked for God's blessing on your life. Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't it be great to work around people like that? What a, what a blessing this is. Look at verse 5. It says, Then said Boaz unto a servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? Now, a damsel, that's a young lady. And the servants, and the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country Moab. And she said, he's accounting, I pray you let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now. That she tarried a little in the house. I do like that. He's saying she is uh, a hard worker. She's not sitting in the house all day waiting on somebody else to work. She's getting up and she's going and she's doing the work and she's taking care of business. In fact, she is there to serve somebody else. I love what we see of Boaz here as he's concerned with the flock. He's diligent over others. He has delegated authority as we see his servant comes and gives report. He wants to know what's going on, good or bad. Is she a bad influence on our household? Let's kick her out. Is she good? Well, maybe we should bless her. Consider his heart in this. He has the heart of a protector. Look at verse 8. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not, glean in another field. Neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. I love his leadership. He just naturally says, Hey, you're here serving, and I hear you're doing well. And you're a hard worker, and you're here. Now, she's here. the gleanings are what was left in the field that they were to leave for the poor. So she comes in and says, can I get what's left over for the poor? I'm poor. I'm taking care of Naomi. She's old. She's at home. I'm feeding her. I'm the young lady. I'm her servant. I'm here to get food to feed her and our household. God's blessed us. We're here. She, so she lays that out to the servant. The servant relays it. Right away, that man recognizes her good spirit. And he says, she's not sitting around in the house all day. She's out working. Well, let me be a blessing to her. So he says, young lady, don't go into another field. Stay in this field. I'll take care of you. I'll bless you. I'll protect you. I'll provide for you. Just as God had done for Boaz, he was doing for others as well. 
Look at verse 9. He says, Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and thou go after them. Have not I charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go to the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Now he's taking it to another level and he says, let my security forces guard you and they won't hurt you, otherwise I'll hurt them. Hey, and you need something to drink, don't even bring your own. Drink out of our cistern, out of our well. Let us provide for you. I love Boaz's spirit and his heart as a leader. He's demanding of her. He's commanding her, stay right here and let this blessing be for you. I do love that he just kind of took the bull by the horns. He was diligent over others. He's a defender of the righteous as he's using what God's blessed him with to be a provision unto others. Now look at verse number 10. Then she fell on her face. You know what they call that? Humility. Humility. My first point was submission and service. My second point is reverence. Ladies, if you want to know what a man is looking for, it's reverence. It's humility. Reverence, not rebellion. You know what she could have said? She had every right. Who are you telling me what to do? Excuse me, sir. Don't you know who I am? I'm my own woman. I don't work for any man. I'll go wherever I want to go. Right? Isn't that the rebellious spirit of most women today that are out in the world, off on their own, out from the umbrella of protection, the wing of their father or husband? They say, I'll do it my own way. I don't need no man. And they go off into the world and they serve some strange man at a business that tells her what to do and what time to be there and how to dress and what to say. I don't need a man. Well, guess what? You're going to get more than one because now you're going to have to obey everybody else. I do love that she was reverencing this man instead of showing rebellion against him. And God blessed it. Look at it. It says in verse 10, Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? She's showing reverence. She's showing thankfulness. She's showing submission. Verse 11, And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed to me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knowest not heretofore. He's praising her for her righteousness. What an awesome thing. That's something that we ought to do. Hey, in Proverbs 3, it says, Withhold not good from them to whom it is due, when it is in thy power of thy hand to do it. You know what that means? When you see somebody that should be praised or rewarded for doing the right thing, we need to stand up and we need to do it. We need to take care of people that are doing the right thing. We need to pat people on the back and say, good job, well done. Thank you for doing the right thing. Thank you for serving somebody else. Thank you for helping. Thank you for being righteous. Thank you for serving God and serving others. We need to profess that. That's the kind of leaders that God's looking for. Look at verse 12. The Lord, again, this is Boaz speaking. The Lord recompense thy work. And a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wing thou art come to trust. He says, you came to trust in God. Well, God bless you. He said, God bless you, but God bless you through me. Let me be a blessing to you because all that I have is God's. And now I'm going to be a blessing to you. So you'll say, praise the Lord. That's always the goal when we give to others or when we esteem others. It's so that they would turn around and say, well, praise the Lord. Verse 13, then she said, let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord. There again, reverencing this man, respecting this man. Then she said, let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me and that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thy handmaidens. It's interesting. You notice, she, she, hey, you've already got a bunch of handmaidens. You've got servants and everything and you're treating me really well. Notice she's respecting and reverencing. She's not criticizing. She's not making demands. Well, here's how this is going to work. If I stay around here, I'm going to expect of you to be able to do this. She was humble, 
honoring the man that God was placing over her. She was reverencing him. He was a righteous leader and she was repaying him with reverence. She was a virtuous woman and this man was repaying her with honor, esteem, value, food, protection, provision, blessings from God. Verse 14, I like this. It says, And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime, come thou hither and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. Now he's saying, You can eat lunch with us, right? And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed, and left. And when she was risen up to glean, wait a minute, then she went back to work after lunch. You want to, I love this of this young lady. She has such great work, work ethic, she's going to finish the job. She didn't just take what she could, eat and go. She said, now I'm going to go back to work and finish the job and I'm going to get a full portion. I'm taking care of Naomi at home. That was the whole reason she was there. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young man saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and reproach her not. And he said, don't you run her off and you let her even get, in fact, why don't you encourage her to get in the good crop, not just the leftovers? That was kind of neat too. That's an even higher blessing. He says, treat her like she's one of ours working for our team. She's just going to take it home on her own. Verse 16, and let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her. Here, now this is giving alms where the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Hey guys, and while you're at it, leave some really good portions for her so it's easy for her to get. Let some handfuls of purpose fall unto this young lady because she's serving the Lord. Let it fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. Verse 17, so she gleaned in the field until even and beat out that she had gleaned. And it was about an ephah of barley. And then she finished the work. She stayed until the end. She did all the hard work. She worked all the way to the end and she finished the job. You know, a saying that I like to say in my house What's a job half done? Not done. Not done. <laughs> if it's half done, it's not done. If she brought all this stuff home and it's like, oh, but we can't eat it yet. We can't make bread tonight. There's no dinner. We have to still do the other products. She, she worked all the way through and finished her job. She was faithful to the end. And that's, you know, if, if you are doing a job halfway, if you're not finishing the work, you're leaving it in the field, that's a handout mentality. She didn't go and stand in the gate and say, who will give me food? She went and begged, can I please come pick up your leftovers so I can take it home? Because I'm, I'm providing for somebody. I'm serving them. What a great heart she had. Verse 18, and she took it up and went into the city and her mother-in-law saw that she had gleaned and she brought forth and gave it to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. And her mother-in-law said unto her, where hast thou gleaned today? And where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. She's, she's blessing those that have blessed us, right? And she showed her mother-in-law whom she hath wrought and said, the man's name with whom I brought is Boaz. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, The man is near of kin to us, one of our next kinsmen. She's asking God for his blessing. Look at verse 21. And Ruth the Moabite has said, He said unto me also, Thou shalt keep fast by the young men until they have ended my harvest. And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens and they meet thee not in any other field. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. Uh, she's saying, obey him. He's our next head, if you will. He's the next best thing to a man over our house that we have. And you need to submit fully to him and obey him as he's trying to bless us. Chapter three, I want to point out the patience and the purity in this situation. Verse 1, it says, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall not I seek rest for thee? Remember what that rest was? Finding a husband. Shall not I seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? And now is not Boaz of our kindred, of whose maidens thou wast? Behold, he went with barley for tonight in the threshing floor. She's teaching her to submit and give service. And I want to point out, she's going to do it God's way. They're going to do it the right way. They're not going to jump in a situation in advance. They want God's blessing on their life. And I do have to stop and make a little point here. Matchmaking is actually biblical. I didn't get one amen on that. <laughs> 
Matchmaking is actually biblical, but be very careful about it. What, did, did somebody? By the parents? By the parents? <laughs> be very careful with that and only do it through much prayer. But it is biblical. There's more than one instance of that. Anyway, verse 3, wash thyself therefore. He says, hey, clean yourself up. She's telling her. And anoint thee and put on thy raiment upon thee and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto the man until she have been done eating and drinking. It's interesting. She's uh, preparing herself physically. She's preparing her heart mentally and spiritually. And listen, young ladies, I just want to encourage you in this. Prepare your heart now to be a sacrifice for your husband. And God, prepare yourself mentally and physically. Make yourself attractive to your husband. That is also important, but not just physically. True beauty is in the heart. It's who you are as your attitude, your spirit, your person. Verse 4, And it shall be when he lieth down that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie, and thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay thee down, and he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And he shall say unto thee, all that thou sayest unto me, I will do. And so she lays at his feet this form of submission. Notice she didn't come in bossing him around. She came in to bless him, not boss him. Verse 6, and she went down under the floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn and she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself. And behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. She says, I am your servant. Spread therefore thy skirt over thy handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. She says, You own me. Verse 10, and he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast shown more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, insomuch as thou followed not young men, whether poor or rich. He's really impressed because he knows her reputation of taking care of a mother-in-law. And when he says, boy, the way she talks to her mama, I know she'll respect me. The way she reverenced me when I was being a blessing to her, it was reverence instead of rebellion. It was submission and service instead of selfishness and sensuality. He knew right away this would, this would be a good thing. He gave confidence to him that this would be a good, godly woman. But I also want to point they waited and made sure they did things lawfully. Uh, verse 11, And now, my daughter, fear not. I will do unto thee all that thou requirest. For of the city my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. You've got a reputation. Everybody knows you're a godly girl. That's what I'm looking for. Only that will do. Verse 12. And now it is, tr it is true that I am thy near kinsman, howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I. Tarry this night, he says, wait, and it shall be in the morning that I will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman well. But let him be the kinsman's part. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of a kinsman to thee as the Lord liveth. Lie down until the morning. So she stayed. They were patient. Listen, if you're going to get married, you have to do it the right way. You absolutely have to do it the right way. In 2 Timothy 2, it says, And if a man will also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The Bible calls physical interaction fornication. Anything before marriage is fornication. If you lay your hands on another person, that is called fornication. 1 Corinthians 7, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. God has put those desires in us, but let's not be sensually driven. Let's not be selfishly driven. Let's say, hey, I'm waiting for the one and I have a gift of purity that I want to give to the one and I don't want to mess that up. They didn't mess it up. He said, we're going to wait. We're going to do it lawfully. We're going to do it publicly. We're going to do it in the light. Everybody's going to know that it's right. And I have to tell you, showing your nakedness is shameful unless it's in the marriage bed. Every time nakedness is mentioned outside of the marriage bed, it's called shameful. Hebrews 13 says, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. 
But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Marriage is a one-time thing is God's goal. And you're married and you stay together and you don't mess that up. And you don't show your nakedness to somebody else. And listen, that means controlling your sensuality. We don't want others to see our nakedness. The Bible describes nakedness from the thigh, which right there at the knee, all the way up to the groin, the belly and the chest are described as nakedness. If you say, how do I know if my outfit is appropriate? Well, you need to cover from your neck to your knee, and you should not expose these parts of your body to anybody else except your spouse, and that's it. Anything else is shameful in God's book. Look at the next chapter, chapter 4. Look at verse number 10. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his place. You are witnesses this day. I want to show you this public-private parallel that the woman serves the man as a king privately, and he blesses her and honors her publicly. But sometimes women, they like to dishonor their husband publicly, don't they? And it's shameful and it's ungodly. It goes against God's will. She bowed to him as a king, down to his feet privately. She was rewarded publicly. Hey, and if you rebel publicly, you'll be rebuked publicly also by the Lord and perhaps your husband. He was honorable to her. He did not defile her purity in private. He was not abusive to her. He was not manipulating. He was publicly rewarded with a wife that others respected for her purity. I want to point out something here. If you notice, he took her. It is not the other way around. Now, she submitted, she let him know, I'm submitting to you. Hey, I, I'll be your wife if you want me. But it, always in the Bible, it's the man that takes the wife and the man owns the wife. That's how God does things. I know this can be controversial today, but... The husband owns the wife. The husband should be the aggressor in the situation. He should do it lawfully and not touch a woman until she is his wife. There should not be physical interaction until they are married. And when he takes a wife, you know, he in a lot of ways is giving up his freedom because he's promising, I will be responsible for you. I will take care of you. And she will reverence him. God's perfect balance is found in the marriage relationship. In the rest of the book, it goes on. I won't go through it for the sake of time, but she was blessed for doing it right. They praised her and said, the blessings of the womb be upon her, that she would have many children, and she did. And so just to review, submission and service, not selfishness and sensuality. Reverence instead of rebellion. Patience and purity Instead of perverseness, these are the characteristics that Ruth was given by a godly mother-in-law, Naomi. What a great lesson that we've learned here. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you, and I do pray that you would use these scriptures and this doctrine to help us to understand our part. Lord, help us as those that are married to encourage the next generation to do it right. Lord, help us that are married to be good leaders and submit where it's appropriate. Lord, we thank you for the many marriages in our church, and I look forward to the ones that are to come. Lord, I pray that these scriptures would go into the heart of the singles and be a guide for them how to have a godly marriage. Lord, we love you, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.